much, Mr. Speaker. I'm so proud to be here today with my distinguished colleagues from the Congressional Black Caucus to present our budget for fiscal year 2015. Uh, we've spent the last week, uh, two weeks, analyzing the House Republican budget, and you've heard here on this floor today uh, the flaws uh, in this budget, it, that it doesn't reflect the needs of our nation, that it achieves uh, deficit reduction by imposing more austerity provisions at the expense of our most vulnerable populations, it stifles economic growth and our ability to compete on a global scale. But instead of just criticizing the majority's budget, the Congressional Black Caucus once again has done the due diligence to put together a budget alternative which we believe meets the highest priorities of all Americans. Uh, first of all, it reduces the deficit responsibly. Uh, secondly, it constructs a meaningful job creation package, something Americans desperately need. It invests in our infrastructure and education so we can grow our economy. It ends the ongoing threat of spending cuts due to uh, sequestration. It raises revenue through the tax code fairlies. We just cannot cut our way to prosperity. And finally, uh, it extends a compassionate hand towards those who live in poverty, which is the signature and the heart of the Congressional Black Caucus budget. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to now yield time to the chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus, Ms. Marsha Fudge. How much time? Uh, I would like to yield two minutes to General Lady, uh, Representative General Lady from Ohio is recognized for two minutes. Thank you for yielding. Uh, as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, I am proud to once again propose a fiscally sound and morally responsible alternative budget. The CBC has a long history of introducing an alternative budget that protects and invests in programs that are vital to our communities. Our budget emphasizes the CBC's commitment to eradicating poverty in America by increasing economic opportunities through robust investments in education, in infrastructure, affordable housing, domestic manufacturing, small businesses, and job training. Though tough decisions are required to ensure our country's fiscal future, we do not believe the well-being of the most vulnerable in this nation must be sacrificed for us to remain on the path to economic recovery. The CBC alternative budget for fiscal year 2015 remains true to the principle of opportunity for all. The Ryan budget, on the other hand, completely misses the mark. It disregards the fact that millions of Americans struggle to feed their families and find jobs. It requires sacrifices of the most vulnerable, including the youngest and the eldest among us. As reported by the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, some 69 percent of the cuts in Chairman Ryan's budget come from programs that serve people of limited means. These disproportionate cuts, which account for $3.3 trillion of the budget's $4.8 trillion in non-defense cuts over the next decade, contrast sharply with the Ryan budget's rhetoric about helping the poor and promoting opportunity. Need I say more about that? To my colleagues in the House, the CBC substitute budget is the best blueprint. Let's build a stronger, better, and more fiscally responsible America together. I encourage all of my colleagues to vote for the Congressional Black Caucus budget. I yield back my time. General Lady yields back. Thank you. What, so purpo what purpose does the gentleman from California seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I rise to claim time in opposition. The gentleman from California is recognized for 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I yield myself six minutes. The gentleman from California is recognized for six minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the budget substitute offered by the Congressional Black Caucus is a good faith effort to lift a growing portion of our population out of chronic poverty and despair, uh, a, a goal all of us share. It attempts to do so over the next 10 years by raising $2.3 trillion of taxes on corporations and the wealthy and running up an additional $4.3 trillion of debt uh, to increase overall uh, federal spending by $6.7 trillion uh, to fund so-called stimulus spending uh, relative to the Republican budget. My fear is that it will accomplish exactly the opposite of what it intends, harming the very people it's trying to help. Now, let's start with some fundamentals on tax policy. Uh, first, we need to understand businesses do not pay business taxes. 
there are only three possible ways for business taxes to be paid. They're paid by consumers as higher prices, they're paid by employees as lower wages, and they're paid by investors as lower earnings, your 401k or your pension plan, for example. Secondly, we need to understand what a trillion dollars is. Divided by the number of U.S. households, it comes to about $8,200 for every family in America. And as much as we like uh, talking about taxing the wealthy, there aren't enough wealthy people in this country to make more than a dent in these numbers. Indeed, many of the so-called wealthy are actually small businesses filing under subchapter S. Raising taxes by $2.3 trillion ultimately then means families on average will have $18,000 less to spend on their own needs that they will pay through higher prices in stores, through lower wages at work, or as lower retirement savings. Uh, in addition, the CBC budget would plunge our nation $4.3 trillion further into debt after 10 years relative to the House Republican budget. That's more than $35,000 uh, per household. Now, that's not a theoretical number. That amount plus interest will have to be paid back in future taxes just as surely as it appeared on your credit card statement. In fact, families will be required to pay this debt back before they pay their credit card, and the IRS is quite insistent that they do. Now, again, not all of that will be direct taxes. Much of it will be hidden in higher prices, lower wages, and lower retirement savings for families. But make no mistake, it must all be paid back, and families will bear that burden. Now let's look at the massive increase in spending uh, designed to jumpstart the economy. Uh, that policy has already failed us and failed us miserably, and here's why. Government cannot inject a single dollar into the economy until it has first taken that dollar out of the economy. If I take a dollar from Peter and give it to Paul, it's true. Paul's going to have an extra dollar to spend. He's going to take it into a store. The storekeeper's going to order more inventory. The manufacturer's going to order more resources, and that dollar will ripple through the economy. But we have completely forgotten the other half of that equation. Peter now has one less dollar to spend in that economy, one less dollar to ripple through it. So in the end, we've not stimulated the economy at all. That's why the trillions of dollars we've already spent trying to stimulate the economy have not worked. Indeed, this does great damage to the economy because we're transferring huge amounts of cash to the productive sector, which invests its money based on the highest economic return of a dollar, to the public sector, which invests based on the highest political return of the dollar. Those are two very different things. Indeed, that's the difference between FedEx and the post office, it's the difference between Apple Computer and Solyndra. It's the difference between the Reagan recovery and the Obama recovery. So I beg my colleagues to reconsider. We've tried these policies, and they do not work. Under this administration, we've seen record tax increases, record spending increases, and record debt. And the result is tragic. The poverty rate for Americans of African heritage has grown from 12 percent in 2008 to 16.1 percent today. Median income for white households has declined 3.6 percent during this administration, but has dropped 10.9 percent for African American households. Now compare that to the Reagan years, when median income increased for all Americans by 4.4 percent, but grew 4.5 percent for uh, African-American households. No one doubts the sincerity of the Black Caucus in bringing this budget substitute to the floor. But there's an old saying, you can't fix a broken bucket by pouring more water in it. At some point, you have to fix the bucket. The House Republican budget does this by reducing the tax and regulatory burdens that are choking investment and job creation and that are causing the long, cold winter that our country has endured. If we want to see mourning again in America, we need to restore the policies that have produced it before. And with that, uh, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from California reserves his time. The gentlelady from Wisconsin. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to now yield three minutes to Assistant Minority Leader Jim Clyburn. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized for three minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the lady for yielding me this time. Mr. Speaker, 
I rise in strong support to the Republican budget.